I'm recording now. Hi, everybody. Um, so tonight we're going to be talking about setting boundaries with yourself. Um, so when I was, if you're not familiar with the, the topic of boundaries, you can go back and watch the introduction to boundaries video that I did a few weeks ago. Um, but as I was studying the topic of boundaries, and most of the study that I've done with it, with boundaries has been with the, um, with the book um, Boundaries by um, Cloud and Townsend, and that's pretty much the gold standard book for the subject of boundaries. They have a lot of knowledge and wisdom in there, and um, it's, a, it's one of the main books people read on this topic. And um, as I was going through that book, I noticed that the, the topic of um, boundaries with yourself was, on, was like on chapter 13. And I thought, that's funny because I'm, I'm kind of thinking as I'm going along, reading the principles of boundaries that, um, that getting boundaries with yourself is pretty important before you can have good, healthy boundaries with other people. So I got to thinking, I think I'm gonna address this one because we talked about, um, you know, boundaries being all about taking responsibility for yourself, but not for other people. So let's look um, more into that. Um, so when we're talking about um, establishing boundaries, um, a lot, most of it's about um, taking responsibility for yourself. And when you're thinking about um, your interactions with other people and the, the choices that you make, um, it's good to realize that you can't control other people, but you can influence them. And the main way that you can influence people is by controlling yourself and your actions and responses toward other people. So you can't, you know, it's, it's really important that you, you know, get get a hold on, on the, the ways that you respond to people and the ways that you act yourself. Um, and so when, when you're setting boundaries with people, it's important and with yourself, it's important to take ownership over your thoughts and actions and then let other, allow other people to, to take ownership of their thoughts and actions and don't try to take ownership for them. Um, so it's important to remember that we are responsible for ourselves and to others. That's a big, major principle of boundaries. So now we're going to look at kind of what does the Bible say about this subject? Does the Bible um, have a lot to say about having boundaries with yourself? And I think it does. It, it says a lot about boundaries and um, the Bible doesn't use the word boundaries, but it does talk about self-control and discipline. And it's a really important concept because you have to have self-control and discipline to be able to follow the principles and the standards that God has set forth for us in the Bible. Um, if you look at um, a lot of places in the Bible, God, it's pretty, it becomes pretty clear that God gives us the freedom to choose um, healthy and God honoring thoughts and actions, which can be described as can lead to life and blessings, or you can, um, choose unhealthy or sinful thoughts and actions that can lead to death and curses. And we see an example of this when God is talking to the Israelites about um, the choices that they make. And he says in Deuteronomy 30 verse 19, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore choose life that you and your offspring may live. So clearly God has given us choices on the things that we can do. He lets us mess up and do, uh, make bad choices, but he really strongly, strongly suggests that we make good choices. We live according to his standards because he, in, he gives us a lot of instruction about what kind of standards we are to live by because he knows exactly what we need to live um, a good life. He knows the things that will give us life and not lead to death because he truly wants the best for us. God loves us and he knows that that um, living in a certain way that he's prescribed for us is going to lead to life. He knows that it's a blessing to, to, um, 
to bear his image through godly living. And he also wants to keep us from the destruction that comes from sinful and unwise living. Um, the Bible also, um, oops, I went too far. Go back. Um, the Bible also talks about how self-control is going to be um, one of the, one of the fruits of the spirit that will produce as we, <clears throat> as we walk by the spirit um, and we obey uh, Jesus and what the Bible tells us to do. Um, as Christians, I think most of us desire to be like Christ and we want to please God in our actions and the things that we do. So if we want to do that, it is very, it is imperative that we become disciplined, self-controlled people. We will produce good fruit if we are walking by the spirit and obeying, obeying God. And one of the fruits produced by the spirit is self-control. Galatians 5 22 through 23 is, says, uh, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. So those are the things that God wants to see um, being produced in our lives. And um, having self-control is a big factor in producing good fruit. Um, and so I think it's important to, to note that, um, that God talks a whole lot about having responsibility over yourself and having self-control rather than a lot of people have a weird concept of, you know, the spirit controlling them, God controlling them and taking over. And that's not what God wants to do. He wants us to control ourselves. And that requires a concerted effort to submit to God's will and to walk by the Spirit. We can have help from God, but it's going to re mostly require us to take responsibility for ourselves and God um, allow God to work in our lives in that way. So um, I think we're all pretty familiar with some of the areas where we lack self-control, some common areas that people struggle with. Um, probably all of us struggle with at least one of these things, and um, it's, it, um, it's, we'll just briefly go over these things so we can kind of get an idea of what, what we need to work on. Um, so first thing is food. Um, a lot of people struggle with overeating or binge eating or just choosing unhealthy foods for comfort. The problem with this is that that eating the wrong foods or too much or too little food can keep us from being healthy and energized to do the work God has for us. So food's there for a purpose, but it has to be used properly, just like any of these things we're going to mention. Um, money, uh, a lot of people struggle with money problems, um, impulse buying, overspending, living beyond means, credit problems, frequently borrowing from others, and also enabling others poor poor financial choices. That's one you might not think of because not only is that, you know, enabling somebody else to do, to do something wrong with their finances, it also can take away from you. And in all of these things can keep us from having the means to give to people that are in need, that truly need them, that need our, our resources and for us getting our needs met as well. So those are some things to think about. Um, time, uh, um, people that struggle with self-control of time um, can be chronically late. They miss deadlines. They're often unprepared because they didn't spend their time wisely, like unprepared for presentations or for um, school, or um, they are also sometimes just don't even show up for their commitments. And they also, sometimes don't pay their bills on time. So all of those things can be, can result in consequences, sometimes serious ones like losing your job or getting your water shut off. So it's very important that we are smart with our time. And related to that is um, task completion. Some of us are good at starting, but not good at finishing. So um, part of that is not using time wisely, but also lacking focus and really following through on the things that we're supposed to be doing. Um, 
Another area that's really a big deal is, is the words that we use when um, we're talking to other people. Um, some major issues are gossip, um, dominating conversations and talking too much, sarcasm, which is indirect hostility toward others, threats, which is direct hostility, um, using flattery to gain approval, embellishing the truth, manipulation, and lying. And the Bible really talks about the importance of the words you use and how, you know, the power of life and death is in the tongue. Um, and James says that, and if you say the wrong word, literally you could, you know, that could be it for you. So, you know, you really have to be careful because you can, you can really encourage and lift up and benefit others and yourself through the words that you use, or you can really tear down, um, be destructive and hurt others and yourself through the words that you choose. Um, sexuality is one that's a really big problem. Um, we all know there's a lot of forms of sexual immorality, but, um, but the biggest problem with getting um, with this issue is that it's usually um, done in isolation from others. So when you're living in sexual sin, you're, you're not usually other people don't usually know about it. It's very secretive and shameful, and it isolates you from healthy relationships with God and others. And it's also sometimes used as a replacement with healthy relationships with God and others. And it uh, can cause you to live in darkness and secretiveness to where you won't be able to get help out of uh, that problem because you're, it, you're so living in shame from, the, from these issues. And so, and, it's a pretty serious thing to get caught up in and, and, and your lust will never be satisfied when you get caught up in sexual sin. One, I, I think um, kind of relates back to the time thing. I just thought it was its own special category for our modern day, um, our modern day world is electronic devices. And these things are hard because they help us in a lot of ways, but and we kind of need them to be able to function in the real world, but they're also a problem because they're, they're so easy to get addicted to. Um, social media, online news, being on call, which is like being available for people all the time because you have your, your phone with you and people are always, if people are always able to, to get a hold of you for work or personal reasons and maybe some apps that you're, um, that you might have um, an out of control um, time spending on. The problem with um, allowing electronic devices to be used improperly is that they can distract you from relationships and more important tasks. I call these devices are designed to literally be time sucks for you. Sorry for the, if that's not a nice word, but it, it's, they really literally suck you in to where you you just can't stop. It's they're they're designed for that because they want you to keep spending more and more time on these um, apps and and uh, news sites so that they can make money. The people that make these uh, that make these products. So it's really important for you to have some healthy boundaries around your electronic devices, and it will take a, a extra work because it's just really designed for for to um, get you hooked on it. Um, and also, obviously, uh, substance abuse is a problem. You've got drugs, alcohol, et cetera. So um, those cases, you're usually pretty out of control when you're addicted to those things. So that can take a lot of, ex that, that's something that will cause, uh, require a lot of help to get out of if you're struggling in that area. Okay, so it's really important when we're trying to get boundaries with ourselves that we, we have to learn how to say no to ourselves. Um, so it's, the problem is it's sometimes harder to set and keep boundaries with ourselves than it is to set and keep boundaries with other people. Um, and so it begs the question, why doesn't our no work on ourselves? Um, and Cotton Townsend addressed this issue in their book and they say there's three reasons, three main reasons why our no doesn't work on ourselves. Number one is we are our own worst enemies. An external problem is easier to deal with than an internal problem. It's way easier to address something, sometimes it's way easier to address something with somebody else 
um, a problem you have with a person or set boundaries with them than it is to deal with the fact that you are the problem. You have an issue, an internal issue that you need to deal with. That can be harder. Um, number two, it's hard because we try to, we try to um, do these things, set boundaries with ourselves outside of relationships. When we really are struggling in an area, we can often withdraw from the relationships that we need and be stuck in secrecy and isolation. And those things, being um, secretive and in isolation can keep us from having the accountability and help that we need to overcome our personal struggles with self-control. Um, so it's really important that we, we keep that in mind that, you know, that we, we need to get into some good, healthy relationships. And the third problem is that we try to use willpower to solve our boundary problems. Um, a lot of times, you know, some people just say, oh, I'm just not going to do this anymore. Well, the problem is you just can't, you can't just stop it. If you can stop it, you already would have stopped it. If it's just as easy as saying, I'm not going to do that anymore, um, then if it was that easy, you could have already done that. The problem is the boundary, boundaryless part of our, of our souls rebel, rebel against the, the willpower to disengage from an out of control behavior. So um, I've looked at some studies that have shown that willpower alone doesn't work. So um, j just in the moment being like, okay, I'm not going to do it right now. A lot of times if, if we don't, if we're not prepared ahead of time, when we get in the moment, willpower is not going to be enough. So that means that having self-control requires some, some forethought and major effort as well as submitting to help from God through his spirit and with some help from other people as well. Um, so the first step to, um, to establishing healthy boundaries with yourself is you first need to identify your boundary problem or problems. So here's some things you want to look at. First, what are the symptoms? What are the things that are showing up in your life because of this boundary problem? Are you experiencing depression, anxiety, rage, um, Look at the, the things that are that are happening within you that can help you kind of see see what what's going on with you. Um, and look at number two, what are the roots? Um, there's always something underneath the problem that the problem is not the problem. The problem is something underneath it that that um, is causing you to be out of control in certain behaviors. Um, some possible roots of, of boundary problems are lack of training, um, rewarded, rewarded destructiveness, meaning other people are kind of bailing you out for um, your behavior, uh, distorted need. You may have a legitimate need that you're trying to fill, fulfill in an, in an unhealthy way, fear of relationship, unmet emotional hungers, um, being under the law, trying to do things your own way, which actually, you know, doesn't actually help you. Maybe you're being too, too strict on yourself. Um, and covering emotional hurt. All these things can be substitutes for healthy ways to, to handle um, life's problems. And number three, ask God, what, what's the boundary conflict? What, what is the problem here? And God will give you insight on some of the other uh, the areas of your life that you need to, to work on that you're out of control in. Number four, ask yourself, am I taking responsibility for this? Who needs to take ownership? It's you. You've got to take responsibility for your out of control behavior before you can start to address it. And number five, what do you need? Ask others for insight and help. And having these deeper relationships are going to it's going to be vitally important to getting to the root of your problem and also finding some good solutions that can help you have a healthier um, relationship with God and relating more healthily to uh, and, and dealing with life as it comes. So then next you'll, um, after we've identified the problem and you've taken personal responsibility for it, you can begin to set and keep boundaries with yourself. Um, so here's some, some practical steps to, to um, start practicing healthy boundaries uh, with yourself. First, um, address your real need. Um, we just 
kind of talked about how a lot of times the root of the problem is that you have a legitimate need that you that you are trying to fill in an, in an unhealthy, ungodly way. Um, when you think about addictions, really, why are, why do people get addicted to things, um, to substances, or and what is what is at the root of that? Addiction is pain management, is what it is. The reason people get ad addicted to substances or uh, relationships or sex is because they're trying to to ease their pain. They're trying to heal from their pain, but it's not working. It's actually adding to their pain. So you're going to have to find a healthier way of healing from your pain. And a big part of that is going to be allowing God and Jesus to heal your wounds, whether they be physically, emotionally, spiritually, mentally, or some combination of any of those things. So the second thing that you need to be aware of is that you need to allow yourself to fail. So once you start setting these boundaries with yourself, you can't expect yourself to be 100% perfect at addressing the problem and um, getting better in the area that you're trying to work on. Um, it's important that instead of wallowing, you know, that, that, you know, that you're not getting better, it's better to embrace the failure and learn from it. So that's how we grow and learn is by, by, seeing what, what didn't work and then trying something different. Um, it, it can also be helpful to listen to empathic feedback from others. So a big motivator for change can be out of love for other people because you start to see how your behaviors, your out of control behaviors are affecting other people. And, um, and that can really help you kind of see the destructiveness of what you're doing and maybe give you an idea of what, what could you do to help the situation and that can help you be motivated out of love instead of fear. Um, also welcome consequences as your teacher. So like, like I said, just a couple lines back, we're going to have failure with this. You're going to have consequences from past bad choices and instead of just being so upset that God, you know, isn't, ch isn't changing the consequences for you or that you're not doing any better. Just, to, just allow the consequences to be there and deal with them and allow God to, to change you through your suffering. Um, and then lastly, and I think, I think this part is, is just really one of the most critical things is you've got to surround yourself with people who are loving and supportive. You've got to get a community around you. You, Nobody should be living um, in isolation. It's, it's not healthy for anyone. God didn't create us to live like that. So the people that you're in the closest relationship with, um, that you're around the most, should not be critical or parental towards you. They shouldn't treat you like a baby, like, oh, did you, you know, did you drink last night, you know, and kind of talking down to you. But they also shouldn't just they shouldn't rescue you from the consequences of your behavior. They shouldn't kind of, you know, act like it's no big deal and just not, not address things with you. The, the most important relationships you have should be, should be giving you the empathic feedback and telling you kind of how you're affecting them and your behavior and helping you, helping you, encouraging you and supporting you to address your real needs and help you build stronger in internal boundaries. They, you, these people are really gonna support your desire to change, not try to hold you back or try to force you into change. Okay, so um, how do we here, how do we ultimately end up being able to, to have self-control and, and become, um, become the kind of people that we want to be, that God wants us to be. Um, we've seen in the Bible that we, we are accountable to God for our actions. So we've got to get, um, find a way to actually make this a reality. Um, it's important for us to know that we aren't alone in trying to, to change and to, in setting boundaries with ourselves. We don't have to do this alone, even if we don't have the community support that we need from other people, we do have, we do have God. We do have, um, we, we do have him in our lives to help us through, through, um, getting better and 
what we need to do is we need to submit ourselves to him because he wants the best for us and he knows what we should do and he's told us clearly and he makes it very clear that submitting to him is very important in overcoming temptation and in having self-control over the sin in our life and um we can see in james 4 7 it says submit yourselves therefore to god resist the devil and he will flee from you so we're resisting temptation by saying i i don't want to do this thing i'm going to follow god and what he says i should be doing and i'm not i'm not going to um fall into that self-control is about taking ownership of and reigning in the flesh to submit it to the will of God. When we submit to God and walk by the Spirit, self-control is achievable. Galatians 5.16 says, but I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. When we're focusing on um, obeying God, submitting to Him, walking by the Spirit, um, these, this is going to become a lot more feasible to us. Um, and it's, it's a lot about mindset, getting, getting focused on on what God wants us to be doing. Um, God And God doesn't ask us to have boundaries with ourselves for no reason. He knows that having self-control allows us not to be enslaved to sin and addiction. And it's really important that we're not enslaved to those things because, because we're so much more free to love other people. We have more time to love and to give to others. We have more capacity. We're not filled with things that we shouldn't be filled with. We're filled with the spirit of God and we're able to outpour that on other people. When we practice self-control and live godly lives, we are being loving to both to God and to others. And so first um, Corinthians 6, 13 and 14 just gives us an example of kind of what we should be focusing on. It says, um, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men and and godly women of God, I'll say that too for the women, and um, be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. That's what we should be focusing on. We want to, we want to be self-controlled, not just for the sake of being self-controlled and how disciplined I am, but that we're able to better love other people and love God and reflect who he is to the world. So, all right, just to wrap up and uh, to summarize, we see that God wants us to have boundaries with ourselves because it not only benefits others, it benefits us as well. We can see that a disciplined life is a blessed life that is pleasing to God. Submitting to God and walking by the Spirit is the way to achieve self-control and keep healthy boundaries with ourselves. And finally, our main motive should be to discipline ourselves so that we can love others the way that God loves us and reflect his image to the world. go back here sorry i'm having trouble getting my screen back to normal it's showing a red stop share button floating around somewhere okay oh i see it okay stop share now you guys are all back to me all right that was superb laura really enjoyed that um I have a million things to say, but I'll have to limit them down and I'll let other people talk first. <laughs> well, let's open it up for some discussion. If anyone, um, if anybody has a question or a comment, I'd love to, to hear it. Um, looks like Dean has his hand up. This is really an excellent teaching and it's really applicable to every area in life with ourselves and with other people. I can see that this is the primary teaching that people need to hear who are struggling with anything. I mean, this is, this is God's word in practical application for anybody and everybody. And this is really excellent. Thank you, Dean. Um, Donna, you had your hand up next. You know, I, all day today, I um, was thinking of internal boundaries. And although 
I'm taking classes and lessons and yada yada, you know, and I have walked this thing out um, of recently, um, long story short, due to isolation and just some illnesses of my own where, you know, I've been alone a lot. It doesn't mean I'm not talking to anybody and being online. It just means that I'm in a different position. It's so easy to be blindsided. And um, when you don't have interactions with people on a daily basis, I want to say how incredibly hard this is for our world today, not just with the, uh, you know, the COVID virus. But um, all day long, I have been <laughs> kind of funny, Laura. Uh, this is so apropos. All day long, I have been reading about the mouth and words and um, taking some reproof in from the Lord because, you know, I messed up royally with a friend of mine yesterday and I shocked myself. Um, she went too far in blabbing with her mouth, you know, in detail over this, something that is incredibly important to me, the battered woman. And she, you know, showed how ignorant she was. And I became so triggered in this conversation with her. And instead of backing off like I usually do, I went, I became hysterical. I don't know myself could be this way, but I just, I just let her have it. I just said, you know, for 10 years, and I just was so, you know, although I was truthful, I was not coming from a place of love. And so, you know, of course, you know, this woman knows me, and it's my way of being to write notes and, you know, to talk about my reproof and to use my lessons of reproof, you know, for myself that I take very seriously when I'm reprimanding myself, then I don't need to be judged in eternity, you know, um, before Jesus. If I can catch myself and self-correct and know my own sin and know where I need to grow and I don't have, you know, somebody, well, Donna, you should do this. If I have that, um, if my uh, educated conscience signals me that I have sinned against a brother or a sister and wounded them, I certainly have to go back and clean that up, um, you know, and not do that again. And so I felt so grieved today that I missed the mark. I really cried. I felt so bad that I, I did it to myself. So don't anybody feel sorry for me. When you need a whooping, you need a whooping. And I think that there are times where you do. So, you know, I'm, you know I spent all day today in the Bible doing verses, writing them down about the mouth and about the heart of kindness that I should have. And so I'm teaching myself, you know, if you can't have a conversation because you're too emotional, please don't have one and back off. If you feel that you're healthy enough to, you know, maybe help someone. But I definitely picked up a few things, Laura, that you shared tonight and taught tonight that I need to, you know, improve in the boundaries. And you know, I am no one's parent. And so, I, I, you know, I think I take this role sometimes. And so I'm in the motion of self-correcting. I don't want to be a failure in love. I don't want to hurt people. But when I do, I always want to feel it. I always want to feel that reproof because that's how you catch yourself and you're honest about it. And then you don't want to continue in that behavior and you want to improve and you want to be able to be, you know, very honest with, with others too about what, where you're at and what you can and cannot deal with. So, you know, I'm, thank you for just letting me come right out here, no mask on, and use this as an opportunity. You know, it's a teaching moment, you know, for all of us, you know, in where we're at, but you no, know, I'm not hiding in the shadows here. You know, I'm just all out there. Because I need that accountability. I need that correction. And I need that growth. And, you know, I can't use my, well, I'm isolated. I'm all sick. Well, then you shouldn't be on the phone talking, trying to help somebody else if you can't even manage yourself, you know? And that's it, self-governing. Manage yourself before you, you know, um, you know, go, we, sometimes, you know, best intentions, you know? But, you know, that, you know, I really felt so bad you know, because I, I, sh I, you know, when I blow it, I just real, I can't scam myself the next day. And so it's been a great lesson for me to have to come back 
to the, to the Bible, the words of God, and write down scripture to reiterate and get them in my brain and in my heart and make it my own, that my words bring life, you know, and that I'm not cruel to others just because they're not, you know, getting it or, you know, or they're acting stupid or something on the phone. You know, I really need to be godly, be more loving. So thanks for letting me share. Yeah, thanks, Donna. That can definitely be challenging. So, yeah, just being being aware of it and, you know, learning from from your mistakes, I think, is one of the best things you can do in that situation. Um, I think John Sant, you were next. Yeah, thanks. It was really, really well put together. Uh, and I don't think any Christian who's really trying to follow Christ, you know, would say, I didn't need to hear that. Uh, my, my question, if you could, ex you know, expand upon it, or maybe somebody else can, and I've heard it said before, it's like, embrace your failure. And that's like counterintuitive in, in many ways to the way most of us face and live our lives or even at work. You know, if you're troubleshooting a problem, it, it's failure after failure. You're, you're not embracing the failure. You're, you're going after the answer. And the same with, uh, I think with, well, for me, like I used to smoke, but I quit like about 30 years ago. But when I didn't quit the first time, if you had a cigarette that day, well, then, then you had four or five of them that day. Same way with, you know, with dieting. If you're on a, a particular kind of diet, you're like, if you blew it, you blew it, and you might as well have another candy bar. You know? yeah. I don't know if that makes any sense, but mm -hmm. uh, if you could explain a little bit more, expound upon the embracing failure part, I, I'd really appreciate that. Okay. Yeah, this one is a hard one to do. I mean, I, I, get, I, get, I get down on myself a lot <laughs> when I yeah. mess up. I think everybody does, but we have to remember like beating yourself up over a failure and just out of heck with it afterward doesn't lead to change. So like you're saying, you, you know, you have one cigarette, I might as well have a whole pack. Well, no, having still ha just having one is better than, <laughs> and so you kind of have to redirect yourself and learn. It's kind of more like learning from your failure rather than being like, it's not like you're proud of it or happy with your failure, but it's more like allowing yourself to learn from it instead of getting down on yourself about your failure, um, if that makes sense, because that doesn't help you. It, it leads to further discouragement and discouragement and negativity can lead to more, um, can lead to more addiction and, and things like that. That's the kind of thing that gets people down and, and not, um, not changing and not growing. Um, I, I have to interject on that point because there's like four different points that I thought were so amazing. There's, probably, there's more, but these are the ones that stood out to me. And one of them, John, was the uh, embracing failure thing. And I wanted to emphasize how awesome and important that is because kind of like the example you, you gave, right? Where if you have a problem, you're, you're trying to fix it, right? But the embracing part is kind of like the process of diagnosing the problem, right? Because if you don't diagnose the problem, how do you fix it? Right. Whereas, so you have to go through this, this time frame of embracing the failure to actually figure out what went wrong. Right. And um, this is something that is just so powerful because if people try to hide from their failures or minimize their failures or ignore their failures or, uh, you know, talk themselves out of being appearing to have failure, whatever it might be, all those things are, are self you know, um, self-sabotaging because then you can't fix the problem. If you deny it's there, you can't fix the problem. If you minimize it and make it a little bit more amenable and a little bit less embarrassing or whatever it might be. Um, and so when it comes to failure, we just have to, I, and this is something that I just had recent insight on when I was reading it, but it's become almost like a, I'll call it a meditation because a mantra is not really the right word, but you know, we know the, the, the proverb, right, where the righteous man falls seven times and gets back up, right? It doesn't say the righteous man never falls. <laughs> so, and, and it's like, 
you can think of that in the sense of like, oh, we're going to mess up. It's inevitable. And that's kind of the normal Christian mindset, right? But I think that's the wrong way to look at it because of course, it's not that that's wrong. It's not that that's untrue. It's just that that isn't really the beneficial mindset that I, that I see in that verse. Oh, we're going to mess up. That's why would, why would the scripture just say something obvious? You know what I mean? Um, but the fact that you're getting back up means that you didn't just make, make, uh, make amends or you didn't get comfortable falling down and just staying down, you know? <laughs> so it's kind of like, you know, if you're always trying to get back up, that, that should mean, you're always trying to figure out how to fix your footing so you don't fall down again in whatever way it was. But anyway, that, sorry, I just went off on a tangent on that part. But Laura, I wanted to mention like of the four things that I've took notes on, they could all be turned into teachings themselves. But probably the most important one that I was thinking about was the personal responsibility part of it. Um, because, you know, this is, this is one of those things that's like big, even outside of Christian circles for people that are trying to like grow and develop personally, because once you write it, and this is one of those things too, where I don't know if you guys have recognized this type of thing, but it's like, it's like interesting, but also kind of sad and depressing to me in a way, when you discover people in the world, basically implementing biblical principles in their life and getting results from them because it's like walking in the truth that's set forth in scripture, but without a relationship with God, getting benefit from it. Meanwhile, you see Christian brothers not doing it. <laughs> and, um, and personal responsibility, I think, is one of those things because the kind of one of the bottom line ways of, of thinking about personal responsibility is that it doesn't matter what happens in your life, whether it's your own fault, whether it's somebody else's fault, if you don't take personal responsibility, for the situation, even if it completely was nothing to do with your error, then you're stuck, right? And so it's like, even if even if something goes wrong in your life that is completely someone else's, someone else's fault, even if it's like maliciously intended, if you don't take responsibility for yourself and like, okay, how am I gonna handle this and move forward rather than just getting bitter or blaming or thinking that, you know, you don't need to change. You need to wait for that person to come around and then everything will kind of straighten itself out and you can just kind of sit there like this until your problem gets solved. That's not, that's not the right way to go, but I'll stop there. Cause the other two I want to talk about were uh, welcoming feedback from others and how willpower is limited <laughs> and what that means with, cause you brought up one of the verses too. Cause you said, submit to God and the devil will flee from you. Right. But then there's another one where it says flee sexual immorality. So what are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to not flee? Or are we supposed to flee? Or are we, are we supposed to not flee because the devil is going to flee from us? Or are we supposed to flee because we need to get away from that sort of thing? And I think that relates to the whole willpower stuff too, is that certain things you just have to create structures that prevent you from even encountering it because resisting it is futile. Yeah. That, that requires ahead of time resisting, not like, oh no, I'm in, in the situation now. What do I do? What do I do? Like, don't, don't go to the situation to begin with if you can all at all avoid it, right? Like, um, so that's just the, the, it, the foresight. You've got to have your mind made up ahead of time. It's not just willpower in the moment. Yeah. Like, not like, oh, I'm in a room full of cookies and I'm not going to eat them now. It's like, no, don't go to the store and buy mm -hmm. <laughs> loads of cookies. If your cookies are a problem for you, like you, you have to plan ahead. So. Yeah. I, I read a book um, maybe a year ago. All right. Dean wants to chat, but I'll finish this. Um, is uh, It's called Atomic Habits. And this is another kind of perfect example of where like the world will take biblical wisdom and then make it plain and it's not something that christians are really really talking about or doing in any sort of serious way um and it's almost like it's in christian circles it's kind of a surface level thing that never really gets extracted into its like minute parts for people to actually learn but it's coming from somebody who you know believes we evolved from monkeys and it's just like <laughs> so anyway because yeah, that just talks through all the different stuff you need to do to break bad habits and, and all the incentives you need to put in place and all the things you need to change about your habits. And 
and routines and it's very cool stuff. But yeah, anyway, go ahead, Dean. <laughs> Dean? Um, were you asking me to go ahead? Yeah, you, you had your hand up, so. Yes. Uh, uh, thanks to Lisa and uh, Julie Allies, uh, I'm on a diet that I need to be on a diet. It's not necessarily a lot of fun, but I have to keep my carbs down to 150 a day. Now, there were a couple nights where I went up to a little bit over that. One night was 160, one night was 157. I've done this for a little over a week now. Most of my nights have been below 150. It's challenging because I'm a candy lover. I love, I love candy, <laughs> ice cream, <laughs> cookies. I see you're laughing, Jackson. Um, it's a challenge, <laughs> but it's something I have to do. So <laughs> this is a commitment that I'm trying. I'm trying to make to bring my triglycerides down because they were 4.98. And then I find find out that one of my relatives. Um, more or less relative, her triglycerides are 613. <laughs> that's really, that's really high. And so she's got to go on this diet. Um, she's got to definitely be on this diet if she wants to live, because that's heart attack issue. Um, and, <laughs> and so I have to, I have to really watch this. Now, uh, I'm able to eat all the, the fats I want. <laughs> But I miss those carbs. So I got to throw in this jo joke. Instead of all the carbs, I've got to have fuel injection. <laughs> yeah. That's a good one, Dean. I've never heard that one. <laughs> fuel injection. Yeah. That that can be a hard a hard area to to um to deal with, but it's like remembering your, your reasoning for doing that and kind of preparing, you know, ahead of time is, goes a long way. You know, the same reason goes back many years ago when I quit smoking cold turkey, no, no patches, none of that baloney. Uh, and I knew I needed to stop, but I remember some black lady that I was witnessing to said, she just reminded me, she said, well, if you want to live longer, stop smoking. If you want to do more evangelizing, stop smoking. And that was the clincher that I finally said, okay, this is it, I'm stopping smoking. And I did cold turkey. It really affected me for a month. And I had friends blowing smoke in my face, you know, kind of junk like that. But I stuck to it and I never, sm I have never smoked one cigarette since that time. I need to have that kind of commitment. But yeah, because we're gonna fail and so, on, on certain things, but we have to realize that that's not the end of the world. God always helps us where we're at and tells us to keep on going, whatever the struggle might be. Mm -hmm. uh, Laura, I, I, uh, you, you had mentioned several times about, you know, relying on God's help, uh, and, you know, pray, praying and walking by the spirit to, to help with self-control. And I was reminded that uh, one of the fruits of the spirit is self-control. And so I was just looking at that section and I realized, you know, the, you know, you kind of look at the whole section. It's, it's really interesting because it, it starts off in verse 13 for you were called to freedom brothers only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh but through love serve one another for the whole law is fulfilled in one word you shall love your neighbor as yourself and <clears throat> then you know he's got he's you know he's going to go on and talk about this but if i you know i'm keeping that you sh that he's he's told them this is the way that you need to be you you shall love your neighbor as yourself and in verse 16, I think that's so tiny. Um, uh, he says, but I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Right. And, and I, I was thinking that 
you know, so much of so much of our lack of self-control has to do with, you know, desires of the flesh. You, you know, you, you're, you're acting out of, you know, you talked about, you know, addiction, right. And you're, you're trying to self-medicate with addiction, right. That's a desire of the flesh is I've got pain and I want my flesh to not be in pain. Um, you know, as opposed to, you know, some other, uh, other thing, but the, but all of that stuff essentially boils down to some form or another of selfishness, um, not respecting, you know, when it's time related, not respecting other people's time, right. And, you know, being selfish in that way. And, um, then he goes on. So, so if we walk by the spirit, we will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And he says, desires of the flesh are against the spirit, um, desires of the spirit are against the flesh. They're opposed to one another. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. And then he gives the works of the flesh, right? Which are all things related to lack of self-control. And, and then he says, I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. He says, but the fruit of the spirit is, and he gives all these ones, but self-control is the last one he gives in the list. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. Um, and against such things, there is no law. And those who belong to Jesus, uh, to Christ Jesus, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. And I just keep seeing over and over here in this section that you know, the key to overcoming anything like that. I mean, yeah, sure. Okay. You can, you can have something in your life that by sheer willpower or, you know, through your, you know, through consequences or whatever you fix in your life. But the reality is we all have lots of these different things that we, we have trouble with self-control in. And I was thinking the other, I, I'm not going to ask you to do this, but um, the thing that I was, I was wondering about, maybe we can deal another time with is, is help with recognizing when you lack self-control and you don't recognize it. And even when you have consequences from it, you're in self-denial about it. And even when people tell you, oh, you do this thing, right? And then you do it anyway and you don't realize you do it. You may know, you may have head knowledge that you do it, but you don't recognize when you're doing it. Um, and I think we all experience that to one degree or another, and yet Paul, you know, over and over again, um, if we will crucify the flesh, in other words, we're not going to live to ourselves anymore. Like Jesus said, you know, basically, you know, you have to die to live. You have to die. Mm -hmm. And that if we'll do that, if we'll, crucify ourselves and instead submit ourselves to God and walk by the spirit that um, a fruit from that will be self-control. Yeah. Thanks for adding that, John. That's a really good passage to, to help us get a better understanding of the, the issue overall. Jackson, you had your hand up again. <laughs> can't help myself because John what you just talked about now was the the fourth thing that I didn't really go into much detail on which was Laura how you brought up I think the phrase you had in the teaching was um listening or listening to empathic people and um and how getting feedback from others who care about you was a super important thing with regards to having proper boundaries. And that's something that I think John is kind of one of, that's why I almost want to group it with taking personal responsibility in a way, because one of the things I always think about is how, you know, myself or none of us, we have, none of us have eyes on the back of our head. Right. And so we all have some degree of blindness about our own life. And, you know, the no eyes in the back of the head is just kind of a, a mind picture for that. 
But the reality is that it's not that we can't turn our heads around and look behind us. It's that each of us has our own personality that has certain bents and certain strengths and weaknesses. Each of us has our own family history where there was like different norms imprinted on us that can be awesome or can be terrible or somewhere in between. And, um, and if we end up in a community of people and then we're not willing to say, Hey, um, I feel like I'm not the best at this or the results I'm expecting aren't coming in this area. What do you guys think? And then getting people's honest feedback that see things with a different set of eyes from a different perspective, with a different background, with a different personality and getting that multitude of counselors around you. It's like, that's hyperspeed, hyperspeed personal growth, right? Because if you think you can just grow by yourself, well, that's unbiblical, but, um, <laughs> but it's like one of those things where you, you have to be willing to invite it and you have to, and then the, this, the other point you made on the same slide at the bottom where you have to surround yourself with people that are loving and caring and that sort of stuff so that you can trust that they're, they have your best interests in mind in the same way that God would. And you can be willing to subject yourself to their opinions, even if they're uncomfortable, undesirable, or uh, challenging, right? So mm -hmm. I loved it, Laura. I loved it. Thanks, Jackson. Yeah, that community aspect. I'm not going to stop talking about how important that is because it's just very, very important to this. Um, Edgardo? Yes, good, morning. Uh, good day to all of you. I missed the topic, but uh, I just want to add uh, a verse uh, to the verses that uh, John Truitt have just read a while back. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, the kind of spirit that uh, we have in ourselves, uh, according to Apostle Paul, it's, uh, it's not uh, the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. And as regards to failure, if you are afraid to, to fail, you are not worthy to succeed, to success, to, su to succeed, you know. Uh, failure is uh, part of uh, living a meaningful life. Uh, it's not really that easy to face failure, but according to Dr. Schuller, uh, failure is not a failure. It does mean that you have to do it in another way. <laughs> you have to invent uh, another way to be able to succeed. But uh, in the scripture, we know that God is faithful. Even if we face failure, God will help us and uh, his faithfulness will uh, always be there to help us to succeed in whatever endeavor that uh, we will be embarking on. I, I thank God. Uh, I really miss the teaching, but I got the idea during the discussion. Uh, thanks for the idea that uh, been uh, shared uh, within the body. God bless. Thanks, Edgardo. We're we're talking about having boundaries with yourself and learning uh, self using self control and how to do that and how to um, yeah how to be basically be a more godly person by doing that. Um, and I think that's good what you shared um, about. When we're talking about failure, you know, it's like, I, I don't want it to seem like with, with the teaching that since there were kind of steps to ha getting here, one thing we need to, we do need to keep in mind is this is a big process with, with failure involved. And it's going to be a thing that you're going to cycle through a bunch of times throughout your life with different things you're going to deal with. So it's like, it's not like follow these steps and you'll have self-control for the rest of your life. It's like a daily submission to God, a daily, maybe hourly, maybe every few minutes, you're going to have to be thinking about this and you're going to have to be, okay, am I keeping the commitments to myself and to God that I've said, I'm going to do that. How do I get in the right mind frame? How do I help myself? How do I set myself up for success? And I think those are some good things to think about. And so yeah, it's going to be a process and you're going to have to learn through failure. And so that's been a big thing we've, we've kind of talked about tonight because it's really important. So 
Did anybody else want to have a question or comment before I close out the recording? I got one more verse. Hey, Jackson. <laughs> Second Corinthians 12, 9. Um, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ, Christ may dwell in me. So that to me speaks of embracing failure rather than pretending it doesn't exist, right? Yes, um, that's, that's a perfect verse and it's one of my favorites. So definitely just being, letting, you know, letting Christ be strong where you're weak and, and allowing him to work in your life, I think is, is a great thing to think about when, when you're trying to deal with these issues. All right, Tony, let's let you have yeah, this word Yeah, here. I just, uh, when I was thinking about self-control, um, made me think of how Olymp Olympiads, how they uh, get up every morning, their, their um, uh, diet is balanced, they work out parts of their body that, um, you know, that, that's weak and strengthen the, the ones that are strong and get the right teaching so they can uh, learn how to compete and win. And then it reminded me of what Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians 9. He says, everyone who competes in the games exercise self-control in all things. That They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. And it just it, to keep your eyes on the, the main goal is is uh, helps me you know n not bulletproof obviously but it does help me to uh to put things in perspective and um seeing these analogies really help too because we see uh we're, we live in such a sports culture and how um they're celebrated for all their discipline and training and such and how they take it more serious than we take our our um our holiness or, you know, God's holiness in our lives. And, you know, that, that can be corrected with all these things we talked about and things that we know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great points, Tony. Thank, you. Thank all right. you. All right. Well, um, I think I'm going to close the recording now. And if you're watching this, we would love to have you join us and join the discussion. We always um, love having new people and um, we hope to to see some new faces soon.